Hi, I'm Kat. And I'm Jess. We're going to walk you through the basics of measuring outcomes. An outcome is a change that happens for people as a result of our interventions or programs. Often in the child and family sector, the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve are changes for children, young people, parents or families. These could be changes in skills, knowledge, confidence or behaviour, or changes in the health and well-being of people, or changes in relationships between individuals or between family members. When we're evaluating or measuring outcomes, what we're really trying to do is measure and understand what has changed or what has improved for the families and the children that come to our services or programs. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. I mean, there's lots of reasons why we would evaluate, but ultimately we want to know how our programs are helping people and what we can do to make our services, um, programs and interventions more effective. So when we're measuring outcomes, first of all, we, would, we need to be really clear about what those outcomes are. And a good way to think about outcomes is that they're like the destination for our evaluation journey. <laughs> yeah. You, so you need to know your destination before you can plan your trip. If you don't have to find outcomes or if you want a refresher on measurable outcomes, watch this video first. To begin with, it's important to choose outcomes to measure that align with your objectives and the program activities that you're delivering. Mm -hmm. You can have a really great survey or a really great questionnaire, but if you're asking the wrong questions, you won't be able to show the impact of your program on the people who participate. To demonstrate impact, you really want to be able to demonstrate change. So ideally, to do this, you would actually measure your program outcomes at the start of the intervention and then again at the end of the intervention, ideally again using the same tool. Mm -hmm. So there's other ways that you can do this, but if you can, measuring outcomes um, pre and post program or before and after your intervention is the way to go. You also need to think about your program's timeframes. Programs in the child and family service sector tend to be addressing um, really complex social problems where change isn't fast or straightforward. So for this reason, um, it makes most sense to measure short-term outcomes, sometimes medium-term outcomes, um, but that you should then be able to use research evidence to link your short-term outcomes with your medium-term outcomes with your long-term outcomes, um, and you can learn more about this from our program logic resources. Jess, do you think there's ever a time where you might actually measure your medium to long-term outcomes? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, there is. If we had a program or service that had been running for a really long time or was a really um, big investment of our resources, we might want to look at measuring um, our longer term outcomes. But our programs are just one of many different influences on um, the lives of our participants. So particularly when you're measuring your longer term outcomes, it can be really hard to disentangle the impact of our program from the other influences in people's lives. This type of evaluation can be a complex task um, and requires really careful planning. So really get some expert help to do this. Mm -hmm. When it comes to measuring outcomes, once you've identified short, medium and long term outcomes for your project, you'll need to select which outcomes to measure based on the time and the resources that you have for evaluation. If you only have a limited amount of time and money, this limits the trip you can take. Choose your destination accordingly because you can't drive all around the country in a few days. Yeah, and you often won't be able to measure every single outcome in your program logic. So for example, if your program aims to improve short-term outcomes for children, for teachers, for parents, it's going to take a lot of resources to be able to measure all of those outcomes for those different people. Or you might have 10 different outcomes for one single target group. For example, children. If you tried to measure all of those 10 outcomes, you'd be collecting data for hours. <laughs> you would. <laughs> so for most services that we work with, uh, who are new to evaluation and have limited resources, we would tend to be saying just focus on two or three short-term outcomes to begin with. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And it's a matter of prioritising your outcomes to decide which ones you want to measure. And you can do this by asking a few questions. So things such as which outcomes can I measure? How many outcomes can I measure? What resources do I need to measure the outcomes? Which outcomes are most closely related to my activities? Uh, who are my activities targeted at and which outcomes will tell me if my program is on track. Right, so it's a balance of what you think is the most important and what you think you can feasibly measure. Yeah. So let's work through a little example now, Jess. Okay. So this is a relatively new program. We've got some limited resources at our disposal um, and we want to do an in-house evaluation. Mm -hmm. So it's a parenting program that aims to strengthen parent-child relationships and parenting confidence. It's aimed at parents of children aged zero to five years old 
and it focuses on teaching parents about child development and doing a bit of role modelling. So we've got a list of possible short-term outcomes here. Mm -hmm. um, which ones would you choose for this hypothetical program, Jess? Hmm, right. Well, I don't think that we'd be expecting to see changes in people's mental health or well-being in the short term. These outcomes would take much longer. Also, they're not central to the program's aims and activities, so I'd rule those ones out. Yep. Parent-child attachment is potentially relevant to the program, but this usually requires observation. So if I didn't have staff with those specific skills, or if I didn't have resources to train my staff or to outsource that, I probably wouldn't prioritise measuring that one. I would consider parental knowledge about child development if I could find a good measure. And I would definitely look at parental confidence because it's a core aim of the program and I know that we have instruments to measure it. So we've talked about choosing which outcomes to measure, but what about the types of methods that you would use to actually measure those outcomes? Okay, you're asking whether I'd use surveys or interviews or observation, right? Yeah, right. So using our trip analogy again, choosing a method is a bit like choosing the transport that we're going to use. Would you take a car? Mm. A plane? I don't think I'd take this plane. <laughs> You'd be fine. <laughs> a train or a bus? Okay, so much. Each of these methods of transport, like methods of data collection, have different strengths and are going to work well in different situations. And are some methods better for measuring particular outcomes? Yeah, it depends. Particular methods are better suited to particular outcomes or to working with particular population groups. And of course, you can use different methods to measure different outcomes, but the method you choose will depend on a number of things. What does the evidence tell you is the best way to measure something? For example, um, if we wanted to measure parent-child attachment, yep. the evidence tells us that observation is the best way to measure um, that particular outcome. Relying on parents self-reporting on attachment is less reliable. Mm -hmm. Other outcomes, for example parental confidence, can be measured well through using a survey or a questionnaire. Yep. We also need to consider our target group, the people that we're collecting data from. What methods will they feel most comfortable with? And when deciding on a method, best practice would be to check in with your target group by organising something like a focus group. But I guess if you don't have the resource to, to do something like that, you could speak to um, a handful of people and do some thoughtful consultation. Thoughtful? <laughs> That's a little bit unclear, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> you don't need to ask every single participant whether they would be willing to do a survey, but at the same time, it's more than just asking a few people, you know, while they're packing up at the end of morning tea. Have a plan for what you ask and who you'll ask and when you'll do the asking. Also consider other factors that might be relevant to your target group. So things like disability, um, accessibility, literacy levels and other things like that. Okay. So, um, for an example, we profiled an evaluation for a playgroup and an after-school group program called Kids Caring for Country. The evaluators introduced regular yarning circle sessions as a way of including participants in um, deciding how the program would be evaluated. As a group, they decided to use a culturally appropriate standardised measure. Um, through this consultation, the evaluators gave staff confidence that they would be collecting meaningful data um, while also empowering the participants. That's such a great example. Thanks, mm. Jess. Next, you really need to think about what can you actually do within the resources that you have. Sure, and you also want to consider um, what expertise you have available. So do you have staff skilled at conducting interviews? Um, yeah. And do you have staff who are going to know how to analyse the data that you're collecting? Yeah, really important things. We've consistently heard that people aren't analysing the data that they've collected. We hear that there's a variety of reasons for this, but it's really best to think about analysis before you start collecting data. Not only because it's an administrative nightmare yes. to have <laughs> heaps of um, data, yeah, but is. also it's actually really unethical. You should only collect data from participants if you have um, a plan to use it. So Jess, we've talked a lot about measuring outcomes, but what about outcomes measures? Right, so seems confusing, but when we say outcomes measure, what we're actually talking about is just a set of questions that are designed to measure a particular outcome. Um, there's a lot of different terms used and they're used interchangeably. So we might say outcomes measure, but we might also say measure, questionnaire, tool, survey or instrument. Um, and within each of these tools or outcomes measures is a list of questions and sometimes we call this a list of items. Right, okay, that makes sense. So standardised measures, that's something that we use a lot in evaluation. 
Um, where do these fit in, Jess? So compared to surveys or to other um, measures that we make ourselves, a standardised outcome measure is a set of questions that um, have been demonstrated through research to measure a particular outcome. Everyone is given the same instructions and everyone answers the same questions in the same way and responses are scored consistently so that you can compare scores across time. Yeah, and I think that's a really good reminder that if you're going to use a standardised measure in an outcome evaluation, you really want to be administering that measure at the start of the program and then and again at the end of the program or, you know, when clients first receive the intervention and again at the end. Mm -hmm. And we call this pre-post testing. So we establish a baseline by collecting data at the beginning of the program and we compare this to data that we collect at the end of the program and by doing this we can measure how much change has occurred for the children and the families that we're working with. Of course, if you're running a program that's been going for a very long time or you have clients that drop in and out of the program, you're probably going to need to choose a different option. So you might want to consider collecting data at multiple intervals or different points in time. And why would I choose a standardised measure? Standardised measures are a really good choice because they have a strong scientific base. Um, developing outcomes measures isn't easy by any means. Constructs like child wellbeing and confidence, they aren't really straightforward and it can take a really long time to figure out actually how to measure those types of constructs. So one of our colleagues actually spent about 10 years developing their own standardised measure. 10 years? 10 years. I mean, that's a really long time. It is a really long time. <laughs> and that shows us that these valid and reliable survey items and response scales take a really, really long time, 10 years, to yeah. develop, test and refine. Yeah. Say we've decided to choose a car and drive to our destination. Should we choose a ready-made car or should we build one from scratch ourselves? The standardised outcome measure is the Toyota Corolla of the evaluation world. It sure is. <laughs> standardised measures, like our Toyota Corolla, have been through years of rigorous testing and trialling to ensure that they actually measure what they say that they measure. And this is something that we call validity. And the scores should stay relatively stable regardless of whether it's competed in the morning or the afternoon, on a Monday or on a Saturday also known as reliability. And if there has been a change in the outcome that we're measuring, this will be picked up um, by a change in the pre and post score. And that basically means it's sensitive to change. Do you want a Ferrari? Yes, <laughs> who wouldn't? <laughs> of course. <laughs> but could you make do with a mid, late 90s Corolla? Well, I probably could, because I know that you do, Jess. <laughs> I do, it's true. Uh, what measures are available? What resonates with your target group? Which car would your passengers be most comfortable in? When it comes to choosing a standardised outcome measure, tell me what we should be looking for, Kat. The main things to look out for, um, the first thing is length. So it can be really difficult to get people to complete really long surveys. We've all had that experience. If you see something that goes over a couple of pages, you might not actually finish the whole thing. Um, the other thing is cost. So some standardised measures actually cost quite a bit of money um, and you might not be able to afford that. So, but then there are others that are completely free. So it's just something to explore and to look into a little bit further. Um, the other thing is availability and accessibility. So can you actually find that particular outcomes measure? Um, is it available online? Is it buried in a study somewhere? Uh, these are all things that you need to consider. Yeah. And can you actually find the scoring instructions? That's another thing. Sometimes you can find the tool, but you can't find the scoring instructions. Yeah, you need to consider, can you actually interpret the data? So most standardised measures will come with scoring instructions, so best to check before you commit. And looking at how the tool has been tested is also a good idea. For instance, was it developed in Australia or overseas? Has it been tested with the same target group as yours? Um, has it been tested in urban settings or rural settings or with a group with different cultural or socioeconomic backgrounds? If the tool was tested in a vastly different context to that of your program, it doesn't mean that it won't be appropriate and useful. You might just need to think about piloting it with a small group first to see if it gives you the information that you need. Yeah, and it's also important to check to see whether the tool has actually been used in evaluation before or if it's designed to do that. So there are a lot of standardised measures out there that are used for um, diagnostic and screening purposes, but that aren't actually suitable for evaluation. You can pretty much find a lot of this information online. Standardised measures that um, are purchasable usually come with a lot of information about how they should be used. 
Uh, if you can't find that information, maybe just do a little bit of a Google search of that tool and it might come up in various reports um, or evaluations and just see what context it's been used in before. And finally, you should choose something that fits your program and your outcomes, which means that when you look at the questions in the measure, they should be relevant to the outcomes that you're trying to impact um, and you should be able to see how the activities in your program will contribute to change in these items. So take resilience for example, there's heaps of resilience scales out so there. Many. But they <laughs> So many, I think there's four. Yeah. <laughs> heaps, there's heaps of resilience scales out there, but they all differ slightly. Resilience is a really, um, really broad concept and it means different things to different people. By looking at the questions and comparing different measures, you can pick something that matches your program's idea of resilience. Yeah, absolutely. So it would be great if there was a one-stop shop for outcomes measures. Sure would be. I know, but unfortunately there isn't. Trust me, I have searched. <laughs> <laughs> we both have, actually. Yeah. But we do have on our website available um, a matrix, basically, that has a list of standardised measures that can be used to measure various parent and child outcomes. Um, and you can access this resource on the link below. Um, and great work, Kat, putting that resource together. Thank Many you. hours went into that one. If you do need something else other than Kat's great matrix, um, Google Scholar is actually a really good place to start. Here you can see what other people are using and how the outcome is commonly measured. So you just search for your outcome, say parental confidence, um, and search for standardised measure for parental confidence and just see what comes up. So Jess, is it ever okay to adapt a standardised measure? Yeah, yeah, nah, look, this won't be a popular answer, but it depends. On one hand, it's better to adapt a tool um, rather than deliver something inappropriate. Sure. On the other hand, any changes you make can have serious implications. My key piece of advice here is proceed with caution. Imagine you buy a car, get it home, open the bonnet and start pulling bits out. The car might not work anymore, or it might look like it works, but it might not be as safe. An engine has been designed so that every single part has a purpose and it works with every other part in the engine. Similarly, every word in every item of a standardised measure has been thought through and tested. The order that the items have been placed in has been intentionally designed and trialled. Any change that you make, even changing a word or removing an item, means that the measure is no longer standardised. Yeah, huge implications there. Mm -hmm. In saying this, in both cars and survey items, some changes are bigger than others. You can put new, you can get your car home, put new car seats on without too much hassle, but if you wanted to customise the engine, you would need the help of a mechanic. Likewise, you can often add a question to the end of a validated instrument, but if you wanted to change the order of questions um, or change the language of the questions, it's best to seek the advice of an expert. And the mechanics in this case are our survey developers. Okay, so proceed with caution. That's kind of the key piece of advice here. That's right. I guess if you are thinking about making changes anyway, though, because you feel you need to, I think it's probably best to consult with your participant group mm -hmm. or your target group to see if those changes are actually necessary. As researchers, managers and practitioners, I think we do tend to make a lot of assumptions about what is and what isn't appropriate for our target group. So it's good to get in the habit of asking rather than assuming. In an evaluation workshop that I ran last year, participants talked about how the staff in her organisation had assumed that surveying clients for evaluation purposes was invasive, unnecessary and that it led to mistrust. Mm -hmm. Um, when they actually consulted with their clients though, they found that clients were really happy to be surveyed and it didn't affect their relationship with the service at all. So the normal process for adapting measures is to seek permission from the author. Their, co their contact details are usually found mm -hmm. online. And speaking from my own experience, authors are really happy to be contacted. You they know? Are. Yeah, yeah, they want to know that people are using their measures. They've spent 10 years, possibly longer, actually developing these things. So they, when they're actually being used in practice, they're pretty happy to hear about it. You might also find that they've already adapted the measure in the particular way that you're seeking to adapt it. Yeah, so they might know of translations into other languages or they might know of how it's been used with different population groups. Not everything is published. Yeah, exactly. And once you have permission, just review that outcomes measure and think really carefully about what changes you need to make. Right, so as Kat said, we should be testing our assumptions by taking our proposed changes to our target group to see what they think. 
You would ideally do this by holding a focus group or interviewing a handful of people. But if this isn't possible, you can just work with one or two participants. So you can set aside some time to go through the survey with those one or two people yeah. um, and you can ask them questions um, like, what does this question mean to you? Mm. Why did you choose often? Why didn't you choose very often? If you can't do that, the second best thing to do is to seek advice from your colleagues. So as researchers who develop a lot of surveys, we do this all the time here at AFES. So it's common practice to email a draft survey to your colleagues seeking feedback before it's tested more broadly. And once you've finalised the changes that you want to make, record them and make a note of why you decided to make those changes. You'll need to explain these changes when you're writing up your evaluation findings so that you're being really transparent about the conclusions that you're drawing about your program's effectiveness. And if you have made changes to a standardised measure, you're no longer using a standardised measure and you just need to be really clear about that. There will of course be times where you need to develop your own survey. So you might want to add some questions, say about how the program has been implemented or there just might not be an appropriate standardised measure out there for your purposes. And I guess you would think that developing your own surveys, I mean we've all done it, it seems like it should be a really easy and straightforward task, but it's actually really tricky because people interpret your wording in really different ways. Yeah, so give yourself time to think about what questions you want to ask, how people will interpret them, how exactly you should word the questions, and also give yourself time to develop the response scales. Ideally, you should partner with someone who has some experience, like an academic or a consultant, but in the absence of that, test your questions with your colleagues and your participants to make sure that they're really clear and that they're being interpreted the way you intended. When developing a survey, there are two types of items that are commonly used. We've got extent of agreement statements and frequency items. Um, some examples of extent of agreement statements would be things like, I feel confident in, I understand, I know how to. Alternatively, if you wanted to use frequency items, you, there would be questions in there around how often do you and how much do you need. And using similar question structures increases the likelihood that people will actually complete the survey. Mm. So for example, having all frequency questions. Yeah. If you do want to use both the extent of agreement and frequency questions, so two different question structures, that's fine. You can do that. Just make sure that you group the same question types together. Yeah, it'll make it a lot easier for respondents to follow that flow. And there's also the response scale to consider. Yeah, exactly. So it's worth considering how many points you want to have on your response scale, particularly if you want to capture change, which you do if you're measuring outcomes. So if you only have a two or a three point scale, it might be hard to see a difference. So for example, if you had never, often and always, it's going to be hard for people to move from never to often because that's a huge big huge leap. leap yeah. mm -hmm. If you have a five point scale, so never, rarely, sometimes, often and always, you're more likely to capture a shift um, if it occurs as a result of the program. You can also have more than a five point scale, so you might have a 10 point scale. Um, this can help to capture change, but it can create challenges when it comes to making sense of the data, especially if you've got a small number of participants. It also makes it more difficult for people to complete. So it's really about having this balance of having enough options so that you can pick up and change if it occurs, and not having too many options so that either participants are a little bit confused or, you know, it makes our analysis really difficult. Yeah. So for these reasons, we recommend using a five point scale most of the time. So for your extent of agreement statements, your response scale could be strongly agree, agree, neutral, mm -hmm. disagree and strongly disagree. And if you had a frequency scale, you could use never, rarely, sometimes, often and always. Before we finish with outcomes measures, we've got some final tips to share. So minimise the number of items you have in one survey, keep it short as possible. Uh, avoid asking the same question in different ways. People pick up on this pretty quickly and it can be quite off-putting. Make sure that your rating scales are all going in the same direction, just as Jess said, so either high to low or low to high. Uh, keep questions really simple, as simple as possible. Only collect data if you're going to use that data. So there are ethical implications. I think, Jess, you already mentioned those earlier. Um, and factor in some time to develop the questions as well as to analyse the data. That's going to take up a fair amount of your time. So you want to build that in. There's also some things to avoid. Um, Kat, I've got a few questions here. I'm going to read them out to you and I want you to tell me what you think of them. Great. All right, so here we go. Question one, I feel depressed and anxious most days. 
Okay, so I think with this case, it's um, a little bit difficult to answer because I might actually be anxious but not depressed. Yeah, so um, the point here is to try and avoid having more than one idea in each question. Mm. So question two, I'm worried about my child's behaviour. I'd say that this is a fairly leading question. Mm -hmm. I mean, by asking me, am I worried? I might be thinking, well, should I be worried? Even though I'm not worried at all. Yeah, okay, good. Um, and our final question, I feel more empowered. Oh, empowered. That's a very big kind of construct, isn't it? Mm. I mean, I don't really know what you mean by empowered. Uh, and I think empowerment is one of those constructs that has many different meanings for many different people and it can be used in a variety of ways. So I'd probably avoid using big terms like that. Yeah, we want to keep it simple. Yeah. And the other thing to avoid is asking too many questions. Respondent burden is a real thing. Yeah. How many times have you started a survey and not finished it because it's too long? So many times, mm. I am sad to say. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and we're evaluating. I know. But let's not forget that there's limitations to outcome measures. Yeah, that's right. I mean, many of your outcomes measures will use self-report. So, for example, your evaluation may demonstrate an increase in school attendance, um, but this might not accurately reflect um, your participants' school attendance. So, factors such as memory and the child wanting to please their parents might influence them and get them to overestimate um, their school attendance, essentially. So other biases may also be evident. So for instance, um, when we ask our target group if they like the program, you know, when they say yes, hopefully they say yes, they might actually just be wanting to please us. Yeah. But you can minimise the likelihood of this occurring by ensuring that surveys or questionnaires are anonymous mm. um, and by explaining the, the purpose of the evaluation to the participants. But you can't get rid of these things completely and no evaluation is without its limitations. However, it's useful to be aware of self-report and other biases that might have influenced your findings. Yeah, and this is just one other thing that you include in the discussion when you're writing up your evaluation results. So let's review what we've learned. Choose the right outcomes measures for your program. It will take time, resources, and a fair bit of testing, but it's well and truly worthwhile. Um, engage with your participants as much as you possibly can. And it's perfectly legitimate to measure your short and medium term program outcomes, provided there is strong evidence base that actually links those outcomes to your longer term outcomes. Standardised measures have been demonstrated through a rigorous process to measure the particular outcomes they're designed to measure so you can trust them. And standardised measures can be adapted but proceed with caution because doing so will change the validity and reliability. If you want to develop your own outcomes measure, ask questions in a similar format, consider your response scales and keep it short. And be really transparent about the limitations of your evaluation. There is absolutely no such thing as a limitation-free evaluation report. You just write them in, you write them up. And finally, work in the child and family sector is about people. So evaluation is the way that we can measure and understand the impact that our work is having on the children and the families that we work with. Thank you so much for joining us. We really hope that you're ready to take your evaluation road trip. And don't forget to check out our other evaluation resources that are available on our website. So Kat, how are you going to get home today? The Ferrari or the Toyota Corolla? I think you've convinced me to take the Corolla. <laughs> so reliable. <laughs> so what reliable. a good option.